So we started off reading the book of Jude. We could have just as easily done 2 Peter chapter 2. They're parallel passages about the same subject. And the subject matter in the book of Jude is basically it's false prophets. And um, specifically here, it talks a lot about how they're reprobate and how they're just wicked inside. You know, this is people who are, dis are described elsewhere, like in the Gospels, as wolves in sheep's clothing. So they want to deceive people. So outwardly, they put on that, that sheep outfit to make themselves look like, hey, we're just one of you. But in the inside, they're ravening wolves just seeking to destroy and dismantle and just um, do all kinds of damage. Right? They're, they're wicked people. They're ungodly people. And you see that all throughout this chapter. I'm not really going to focus too much on any one part of this, this chapter necessarily because um, you know, you see in verse 11, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perish in the gainsaying of Cori. Uh, these are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And it goes on and on and on describing these people. And... Uh, what to look out for. And what I'm going to be preaching on tonight and in the next few weeks is uh, it's, a, it's a Christian cults series. So I put the Christian in, cult, in quotes because they're not really Christian, but they're going to be claiming to be some form of Christianity, but they're really a cult. So what I want to start doing is just by using definitions, I, I found out, you know, everyone has a pretty decent sense of the word cult, but the words get thrown around all the time, and especially in, in the, the climate, the political climate we're in today, it's just like using the word Nazi, right? So people will make all kinds of claims against anything they don't like, or any church, or any group they don't like, well, they're a cult, they're a cult, and they just throw the word around. So I'm going to give some character, I'm going to define cult by using characteristics, but that these things are associated with cults. Now, this isn't meant to be exhaustive. This isn't meant, you know, like, like, oh, well, this group doesn't have this one thing that you said. So they're, no, it's, it's not like that. What, what I'm doing is giving characteristics to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when I say cult. Now, not every group I'm going to be preaching at against is going to have every single attribute to a T that I'm going to be referring to, but it's basically give you a general sense, what is a cult? So some of the things I was able to come up with, and, and, and really um, there's a reason for me bringing these up because there are, everything I bring up is going to, uh, every group or, or cult that I, that I preach on will have, you know, these, refer these references will all be hit at some point by, by these groups that I bring up. So I kind of wanted to, to make sure I get as much as I can here. But um, one of the things that defines a cult is when a group or organization comes up with completely new teachings, like especially, you know, because again, we're talking about Christian cults, so I'm not going to get into everything else of just other weird random cults that are out there. Um, I'm going to be dealing more with a Christian. So when a Christian cult becomes a cult or is a cult, you can be de determined as a cult, typically they have these brand new teachings and they reject some very old, you know, you call them orthodox, established teachings that are real basic, real simple, you know, like the Trinity and um, salvation by grace through faith and, you know, authority of God. You know, there's a lot of things that are just real simple, basic doctrines that even amongst Christian denominations, there is a wide agreement on just because it's so blaringly obvious, right? But a lot of cults will reject that and um, in favor of new teachings, or they'll say they have some new prophet or some new revelation from God. That is a very, um, very significant sign of a cult is when you've got one person who tends to be a very charismatic leader, someone who's able to speak to the people real well and, and you know, kind of control emotions and, and be able to, to get people, you know, riled up. It's a really good speaker, a charismatic speaker. 
um, also then claiming to have, you know, visions and words from God and, and all this extra stuff that's not really in the Bible. And um, that's another sign that, that you could be following a cult when you got a leader that's like that. I'm going to get into leadership in a minute, but just a few more things uh, that I want to bring up that um, typically are found within cults. <coughs> cults will slowly teach people to cut all ties from anyone who's not in that cult. I mean, family, friends, just, just completely separate you from the outside world. And that's what you know, the Bible said in Jude, so these be they that separate themselves. See, they want to get their group together. They want to lead people astray. They want to lead captive silly women taken in sins and just take them captive and, and kind of teach them and brainwash them into their way of thinking. And one of the ways they do that is they need to cut off you from reality around you, from any other outside influences that might be saying, hey, you know, watch out and get a, an opposing view of whatever it is that people are getting wrapped up in, you know, a Christian, you know, a so-called Christian church or whatever. Say, wait a minute, that sounds real cultish to me. Um, and I, I've learned, I've, I've seen a lot of documentaries and, and read a lot about different cults that have existed that have kind of come and gone. And uh, one of the things they like to do is just, uh, you know, you, it starts out, and see, here's the thing. A lot of these things, you might say, well, wait a minute, don't you do that? No, and, and it's not to the same extent. So, like, what, what I mean by that, I was already getting ahead in my mind. They'll get people to work for them, like volunteer work, right? And there's nothing wrong with volunteer work. I mean, that's how we get things done in church. We, you know, we typically, if we want to get things done, people sacrifice their time and do things to get whatever job done. But a lot of these cultish organizations will have people just literally like kind of working around the clock and just really draining them and, and wearing them down and being practically, you know, like sleep deprived and getting them to the point to where they just real feel guilty if they're not getting everything done and kind of getting them under their control and getting them into a state of mind where if you are sleep deprived, you're going to be more open to suggestion and to being manipulated because you're not going to be thinking quite clearly. And when they keep you busy all the time and just focus only on that work of doing, you know, for the organization or for the church, for the cult, um, that's another sign of a cult. Uh, they use brainwashing techniques. I actually copied and pasted this from, from, uh, from online. So, um, they use intim intimidation or psychological manipulation to keep members loyal to their ranks. This could be in the form of threats of dire calamities sent by God if they leave. And again, I'm going to be preaching on different groups. I, I, I need to stop myself because there's so many things come to my mind of people who teach this that I believe are in a cult because they're saying, oh yeah, if you, you, know, if you leave the church, then you're just going to have dire consequences of God. And you know, even if you leave the church to go to another church, oh man, God's going to come down. You look, we don't teach that here or believe that. You want to go to another church? Go to another church. God's not going to punish you for going to another church. Right? Find one where they believe, you know, where they're saved, so it's a real church, but you know, God's not going to come down on you like if, you, if you leave here. Good. Find a good church. That's what I'm going to say if you, if you want to leave. Um, certain death at Armageddon, you know, basically make, taking away your salvation. There's only salvation within the church type of thing. Or being shunned by their family and friends because they leave this church. You know, and that's, and that's not what we teach, but that's what cults or cultish-like churches will do. They have that type of an attitude, and that's a, it's a, it's a vital part of the mind control process. Another thing they do is just with raising money, you know, where it becomes all about um, giving and overgiving and extra giving, and, you know, the tithe's not even enough. You need to do this. And even with the tithe, they'll, like, monitor and make sure that everybody's tithing and they'll have like a copy of your W-2. They know what you make in a year. And like, I mean, people do this. It sounds nuts, but it, but it happens. And when you're, you know, your pledge and you're signed up and you need to be tithing, if your tithe check isn't coming in, they're going to be asking you, hey, brother, where's your tithe check? They do it. And you know why? It's because the cults and the cult leaders are preaching for filthy lucre's sake. And what, what you find, and one of the things that comes across in the book of Jude and in 2 Peter 2 about these people is that they're very um, carnal. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they live for themselves. They don't care about other people. They care about themselves. So you will find them having attributes that's very lusty. 
greedy, greedy after money, lusty after food, lusty after women, lusty after men, because they're reprobates. And that's what we see in, you know, in Jude and 2 Peter 2, that these false prophets that they're talking about are reprobates. And these cult leaders are reprobates. They're out to destroy them. And what they do, since they know, if they're trying to be Christian, which is who I'm preaching against, they're going to try to keep themselves, you know, looking the part that they teach, you know, and, and keep a lot of that stuff secret. But they'll, they'll also twist scriptures and use things, you know, uh, use the threats to get you to comply. So when it comes to things like the, uh, you know, the tithing or something, they'll use scriptures to say, you know, because we believe in tithing here. Right? I mean, we totally believe in it. I teach that and preach that and, and I do that. But we don't keep record of like who's tithing and who's not. You know, we, that, that's nothing we do. It's between you and God. I have no idea how much you make. I don't care how much you make. I don't care if you give. I mean, it's ultimately up to you. And that's the way that we treat it, the, the finances here. But um, they'll, they'll take some verses. They see, look, you're stealing from God, which is a good verse, you know, in Malachi. But then they'll take that and say, well, see, we need to make sure that you're not robbing God. So in order to do that, we need to track everything, you know, and, and, and lead you in that way and, and, and kind of get you stuck into their system. Um, no salvation outside the church. I mentioned that already. They'll use, oh, they usually will use special writings that are, that are unique to just their group as an underlying teaching uh, unique to them only, and it's, and it's usually given by the founder of the cult, the cult leader, right? And who I'm going to be preaching against tonight is the Mormons, Latter-day Satanists, um, and, and the things that they believe. So Joseph Smith, I mean, this is perfect. Joseph Smith had, you know, the Book of Mormon came from him, and he was the one that had divine revelation. He was the only one that was able to read it, when he found his golden tablets, or so-called, right, the, the supposed golden tablets that he found, and, he, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later, when he used his seer stones that no one else could do, no one else could see, it was only him. So he was your access to God. No one else. It's him. And, and this is a sign, a good telltale sign of a cult is when they have their own writings, their own scripture, their own, you know, extra biblical content or their own Bible to, to just preach and teach whatever they want. Um, cults will typically have an unquestioning commitment to the leader, to where it's, it's all about that guy and that you need to support him no matter what. And just people have to have this, this devotion and loyalty to a man, even above God, where you're just, you, you know, you do what he says, he's the God man and you listen and you do, and you just don't understand. If he's telling you to do something, you just do it. And getting people into that mindset. Again, this, this happens over time, but these are the things they do. This is how you know, cult leaders want to stay in power, and they need their group of people to be subordinate to them and listening to everything that he says and does and just will be willing to do anything for them and just, just to have total control. And they, they, they love that. I mean, that's the, uh, carnally speaking, you know, they, they love that power. They like having that influence over people. It's one of the things that drives them and motiv motivates them. Because they're wicked people. Just like people go into government because they want to control people and, and rule over people. It's a wicked attitude to have. Um, another thing that typically in cults is reading or listening to a teaching that contradicts their beliefs is usually forbidden. They don't want you hearing about anything that's going to contradict what they're saying. They don't want anything being called into question of what they're teaching or preaching. Now, I don't recommend certain things, but you guys are totally free to go off and listen to whoever you want. I'll give you warnings about, hey, this person or that person, you know, look out for them. But it, it's all with the understanding of this is where they're violating Scripture. And if people are just completely violating Scripture, then why listen to them? But... That's not the way it is in the cult. It's, it's not that benign, right? It's not that little thing. And you can see how they'll take these little pieces of truth and little nuggets where there, there could be some good to it and just take it to the extreme and, and make it weird and make it cultish where they'd be like, nope, you can't listen to anything. Oh, people are, well, once people leave the church, you can't talk to them about anything. You know, because sometimes people will leave these cults because they find out finally they realize the truth 
You're like, oh man, I've been deceived. I've been tricked. And I need to tell other people that too because they're tricked. They're deceived. And that's what people already see. We don't hate the cult members. We want them to get out of the cult. But there's no ill will for them at all. We want, it, we, want to, we want them to see the truth and see the light. And you know, that's the goal. The goal of these sermons I'm preaching is not to just tear, make ourselves feel good because we're tearing down other religions and make ourselves feel good because, oh, we have the, the truth and no one else knows it and ha ha, look how great we are. Of course not. That's not the point at all. The point is to be able to, you know, because we actually go out and preach the gospel to people and we run across people of all different types of religions and backgrounds and some of them are in cults and we want to be able to reach those people with facts and with information to be able to, to help them to get out of that cult because the cult's not good for them. Cult's going to send them to hell. And, you know, a lot of cults will, will have other ramifications just in their personal life and everything else anyways because they're going to be used and abused. And that's when people sometimes don't come out of a cult until they are used and abused and then they don't want to have anything to do with any god because they've been poisoned, they've been spoiled. And then the uh, leadership, typical um, characteristics within the leadership, usually the one, it's usually one person that's really in charge. But as the cults grow, they kind of open that up to more people just to maintain the control over a big group. And, um, you know, tonight again is the Mormons, and that's a huge group. This is a huge cult. Just because something is really big doesn't make it not a cult. You know, oftentimes people think of a cult as just a really small group with like 20 people and a leader and they're just way off in the middle of nowhere, just, just having these weird, you know, things going on out, just completely separated from society. Those are cults too, but those are definitely not the only thing that is a cult. That's why I'm bringing up all these different characteristics because they're going to apply to these larger organizations that, I mean, that are worldwide. They have millions of followers, but they're deceived and they're part of a cult. The leadership, the cult leader or leaders typically are seen as a prophet or a God man that have been given divine knowledge. They understand things that you can't understand. They've been given special information that requires you to learn from them instead of being able to learn this on your own. You can't go home and just read it in the Bible and, and figure it out. No, you need that leader to give you the information. Um, and they usually will have claims of communication with angels or God or something like that. And again, which is the case of Joseph Smith, who was the founder of the Latter-day Saints, Mormon Church. They, uh, he, he claimed to, to be visited by the angel Moroni which isn't in the Bible, but it's just some angel that, that he says exists. Now, a lot of these cult leaders, I'll say this, I do believe that they had visions in many cases. I mean, some of them might be making it up, but I would say that a lot of them probably did see visions and probably did receive messages, except it's not from God. Right. They're receiving messages from Satan because it's contradicting God's word. And that's how ultimately you're going to be able to tell if what they're teaching is true or not, because we have God's word and we can compare what's being taught and what's being said and what's being promoted against God's word. And that's how we know the truth. So in order to keep yourself from cults, you don't need to learn about every other cult. You just need to learn as much as you can about this. This will keep you in the right path. This will help you to be able to identify all the counterfeits and all the frauds when you know the real thing. So I don't recommend just going out and learning about all these various cults. But um, I am going to teach a little bit about them, just kind of some highlights and some main points to be able to express that to people. Because, uh, you know, my, still my number one method for trying to convert somebody from any cult or any religion for that matter is to give them the gospel. That's a primary thing. The power literally is in the word of God. I'm going to let God's word do the power. However, everyone's a little bit different and some people might want more information, more evidence and might need to have their current faith shaken with a truth bomb, right? With, with, with just a bunch of information saying, hey, did you know this about, you know, the history of your church? I mean, literally, I was, I was out soul winning in Gilbert back when I used to live in Gilbert and um, heavy, heavy, heavy Mormon influence out there. There's a lot of people that are Mormon out there. And I knocked on the door of this, of a black guy. 
who converted to Mormonism. And I'm like, do you have any idea what they teach? Do you know what the, what the, what the Mormons teach about people whose skin is colored, people who are not white? Because it's a racist religion. I, and I got that later in my notes. I'm just going to turn to it right now. I'll read to you what the Book of Mormon says in 2 Nephi. This is one of their books. Okay, 2 Nephi chapter 5, verses 20 to 23. I'll read this for you. And this must be something that this gentleman did not read or get to yet when he converted to Mormonism. I mean, it blew me away. And it's sad if he buys into this stuff. It really is sad. Verse number 20 in their second Nephi chapter 5 says, Wherefore the word of the Lord was fulfilled, which he spake unto me, saying that inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence. And he had caused the cursing to come upon them, Yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. And thus saith the Lord God, I will cause that they shall be loathsome unto thy people, save they shall repent of their iniquities. And cursed shall be the seed of him that mixeth with their seed, for they shall be cursed even with the same cursing. And the Lord spake and it was done. So did you get that? They're saying that these people that, that you know, were sinners and had hardened hearts, God didn't want them mingling with his children. So the way that he cursed them, the way that they wouldn't be enticing unto his children was, oh, I gave them all black skin. Oh, that's where black people come from. That's what the Mormons think. According to 2 Nephi, according to Satan, they get a bunch of white people thinking that black people, oh, God cursed them. And we can't, we can't mingle with them. We can't breed with them because they're cursed of God. And actually, you know, the white people were exceedingly fair and delightsome. We're what God really wanted. We're his children and we're white. And, we, you know, the whiter we are, the, the more blessed we are of God. That's what they teach. And you know what? You know, and, and if, there's, if any Mormons ever listen to this video online, I hope they research and look up the facts for themselves because you can look up. A lot of this stuff is available online. Actually, I think it all is because there's a lot of ex-Mormons that have come out too and even though they might try to hide some things. I mean, this is in the Book of Mormon right here. This is in the Book of Mormon. But they, up until the Civil Rights era, the Mormon church didn't allow black men to be any part of their leadership whatsoever. They couldn't hold office in the the Mormon church. And I'm thinking, why would they want to? <laughs> if this is the crap that they teach, why would you want to have anything to do with that? Why would you even be a member of their congregation? This was my thought about this guy. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I can't recall exactly because I, I, I started to bring that up. He didn't really want to talk that much. But I don't think, he didn't have an answer for me at all. I'll, and that's why I was like, look it up because you know, you've been, you've been deceived, you've been fooled by a religion that's teaching you this, this garbage. You know, the Bible says in Acts 17, 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation. God says we're all of one blood, regardless of the color of your skin. The Bible says nothing about people being cursed with the blackness of skin, covering people with the blackness of skin being, you know, being cursed. That's why they have to come up with their own teachings, with their own books and their own materials. That's how the, that's how the cults work. Um, 
So let's go back to a few more characteristics I want to bring up. And I'm not going to go over these again when I go through the, the, you know, the next coming weeks. I just want you to kind of be aware of this. The leadership is like God, man. Usually they claim to have communication with angels. There's, there's always going to be sexual perversion. That's who, I mean, you see that in Jude. You see that in 2 Peter chapter 2. I mean, this is where you have, they're, they're typically homos or they're engaging in adulterous relationships or fornication with minors or what, you know, just all kinds of weird, weird things that are done. You know, I'm not saying that this is what Mormons do. I'm talking about the leadership, right? There's a characteristic of the leadership or the founder. So when you look at Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith, for example, had, uh, I don't even know, there, there's, you know, I was researching this stuff. It doesn't matter that, you know, the, the precision, the exactness of every single detail. He was a polygamist and there is no doubt about that. But how many wives he actually had is up for debate, right? Or people are saying, oh, well, he wasn't married. You know, I don't care. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. And the fact that he had two 14-year-old wives is a fact. Now, people will say, oh, he didn't really consummate those marriages and stuff, not with the 14-year-olds. Yeah, right. It's weird and it's wicked. He said he was married to people that were already married. He just married his wives. And they'll say, and, and they try to spin this, right, because the, the, the Mormon church doesn't, doesn't like seeing all this stuff. They try to spin it and say, oh, well, really, he was just, you know, it's a spiritual marriage not a physical marriage for this earth. So he's, he's getting married to these people, but, but that's for when, you know, they go to the kingdom and they're going to be spiritually married in the kingdom and not, you know, it's not a physical marriage on this earth. So a woman could be physically married to her husband, but then spiritually. But think about how weird that is anyways. I mean, just, just, just to put this in reality, like I'm the pastor of this church. Let's say I, I wanted to become a cult leader. I'm like, Brother Matthew, I, I need to marry your wife. But don't worry, don't worry. It's not a physical marriage. It's just a spiritual marriage. As if that would just make it okay. Oh, okay, yeah. You could, you could get spiritually married to my wife so that in the afterlife, you, you know, you guys can be together forever. So what, who does that? And if you, once you do that, how is that not going to lead to something physical anyway? You know what I mean? You're, you're creating this bond and you're creating this marriage. And it didn't get physical? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I wasn't born yesterday. But that's what apparent. I mean, how, I don't understand how people can just accept this stuff and it's not a big deal to them. And, and the reason why I say sexual, you know, the polygamy itself isn't the sexual perversion. It's the 14-year-olds. It's the just the gross display of doing this because you know people say oh well there are people who are polygamous in the bible right so abraham had more than one wife solomon had a bunch of wives yeah but they weren't 14 they weren't like children they weren't like muhammad with a seven-year-old or whatever another um indication or a, or a characteristic of a cult leader it requires devotion to them more than the call, you know, to the actual leader. They want the, the attention and they want the devotion. Uh, dissent and questioning of what's being taught is, is discouraged. And usually, um, you know, people will be afraid to say anything at all because you just do not contradict anything that's being taught up. You don't even question it. They need to maintain their authority that if anyone's actually thinking for themselves, that's not allowed. The cult leader needs to have total control. And then also you'll, you'll usually find, usually not always, that the cult leader lives way better than everybody else, right? Because I mean, they're lifted up. They're the one that has all the focus. So of course they need to be getting all of the, the perks of being a cult leader. They need to be the one who's, who's given everything and they usually have a lot of money directly given to them and people are serving them and everything else. And just, and, and you know, and ultimately it's because in their heart, they're wicked hearts. They like being lifted up like God because they're satanic. That's what Satan wanted. He wanted to be like the most high. And these wicked children of the devil do the same thing. 
So in, um, in Matthew 24, of course, we're warned. The Bible says, There shall arise false Christ. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 18. Matthew 24, 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We're told there's going to be false Christs. We told, we're told there's going to be false prophets. We know it's going to happen. We see it in, in many places throughout Scripture. So um, I'm just going to, I'm kind of preaching through the series to help warn you and to warn others. You know, and to help give you some tools to help get these people to see the light and just, just give you some facts. And uh, I've got a lot of information, so I'm going to try to get through this. If you're in Deuteronomy 18, the Bible, God gave us a way to determine if someone's a false prophet in Scripture. Deuteronomy 18, verse 20 says, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, because it, you know, it's easy when people are going to speak in the name of Baal, right? Well, you know they're false. If someone's speaking as a, you know, in the name of a, of a Hindu god or goddess or Buddha or, you know, in Islam, right? The, prop, the prophet Muhammad. No, we know that they're, they're fake already because they're not even claiming the Lord. They're not even claiming Jesus Christ. But God says, okay, if someone, you know, is a prophet and they presume to speak in my name and they're, they're using my name to speak by him, verse 20 says, which I have not commanded him to speak or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. It's real simple. When they say something and it doesn't happen, it's obviously not from me because God's word always comes true. It always comes to pass. It never fails ever, not even one time. God's word comes to pass no matter what, every single time. It says, but the prophet that hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So we're going to look at some of Joseph Smith's false prophecies. Prophecies that he made in the name of the Lord didn't come to pass. And because they didn't come to pass, he is not a prophet of God and not someone that should be looked at at all. Actually, according to God's word, he should have been put to death. That's God's judgment for him. Yet people want to exalt him as some great leader. So here, I printed off, because there's, there's so much stuff. I just printed off from a few websites. This one, to give you the reference, is from uh, Institute for Religious Research. And these are the failed prophecies of Joseph Smith, because this stuff has been well documented by a lot of people. So I'm just going to go through some of the highlights. I may not give you all of them just because I, I, I have a lot of material I want to get through. Um, oh, prophecy number one. This is one of the biggest ones, in my opinion, the coming of the Lord. You know, a lot of these false prophets and these cults want to prophesy, oh, Jesus Christ coming back, Right. Why? Because that puts fear into people and that gets people really, you know, in line with, oh, you better be ready because Jesus Christ is coming back today. And, you, you know, obviously we ought to be ready, but they use this and they use this knowledge to direct people into doing things. And maybe it's, oh, you're not going to need any of that money anyways, because he's coming back. Give it to me. Right. You're, what are you going to use it for? The world's going to end. We're going to be out of here. Let's get this. I mean, Harold Camping just did that. People literally like sold their homes and like gave tons of money. Well, I forget how many years ago it was now. A few years ago, it was a 2012 or something like that when, when all that went down with him. I don't know. You guys might not even know what I'm talking about, but um, there are people, there are literally, I was reading stories about people who literally sold everything they had because they wholeheartedly believed that, oh yeah, this guy is so smart and he's got this dates down and he studied his Bible and he knows that this is, you know, and of course, those dates always come and go because no man knows the day or the hour because you can't just pinpoint any man that says he does is a liar. Besides the fact that all the things the Bible tells us need to happen first, heaven's happened first. The sin of man, the, 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 the son of perdition has not been revealed yet. The man of sin. The, you know, th these things have to happen before the coming of Jesus Christ. So anyhow, he... he his prophecies, the, the coming of the Lord, the prophesies the coming of the Lord, 
Uh, I'm going to read this from you. President Smith then stated that the meeting had been called because God had commanded it and it was made known to him by vision and by the Holy Spirit. It was the will of God that they should be ordained to the ministry and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time for the coming of the Lord, which was nigh. Even 56 years should wind up the scene. This is a quotation from Joseph Smith found in History of the Church, Volume 2, page 182. He gave a reference of 56 years until the, the, the coming of the Lord. And this was spoken in 1835. I think it's been more than 56 years and, and Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet. <clears throat> False prophet alert. Um, Prophecy number two on this list is they have this man, David W. Patton, was supposed to go on a mission trip. So it says, uh, here's the, the prophecy from Doctrine and Covenants 114, verse 1. Verily thus saith the Lord, it is wisdom in my servant David W. Patton that he settle up all his business as soon as he possibly can and make a disposition of his merchandise. Okay, make a disposition of his merchandise, sell all the stuff he has that he may perform a mission unto me next spring in company with others, even 12, including himself, to testify of my name and bear glad tidings unto the world. So keep this in mind. What, we're, what I'm reading to you in their doctrine and covenants is stuff that is supposedly the word of God by the mouth of these prophets. It's, you know, every, what they treat these, these words as literally as scripture. They're called the latter day saints because obviously we're in the latter days, but then they, th what their whole belief system revolves around is that, oh, there's prophets today and that apparently there must've been some kind of gap between, you know, like the disciples and then Joseph Smith of, you know, 1800 years. But then with Joseph Smith, all of a sudden now, They've got the right doctrine and God just has all these prophets. So that's where you have like Brigham Young and all these other guys that have succeeded Joseph Smith as being the cult leader. That, I mean, hey, who doesn't want that position? Oh, you mean like I can say whatever I want and just say it's coming from the Lord and people will believe me? A lot of people there that just buy into this stuff. People have been duped. And yeah, so they thought when, when Joseph Smith was making this prophecy, it was written down as scripture that David W. Patton, he needs to settle up his business, he needs to sell all of his stuff, and he needs to go out on the mission field. This prophecy was made on April 17, 1838. The problem is that David W. Patton died in October of 1838. He was supposed to go out the next year, so he never went on his mission the following spring. But that's the word of God, right? This guy dies before God's prophecy is fulfilled. Yeah, right. And look, this happened like in his lifetime. You know, it's, I, it's more understandable of people today buying into the false religion, not even knowing about this stuff, right? Because maybe they just go to their church and, and you know they're not bringing this up in their, in their church services. So you would actually have to go back and research this stuff or read it up or dig up these books and or really be a, a, a serious scholar of the doctrine and covenants of your church, which I don't know how much they require people to read these things, but they have, it's not just the Book of Mormon that they use as scripture. They have the Book of Mormon, but then they also have the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants and the History of the Church, you know, and all these publications that they still will say are from their prophets. And it's speaking for the Lord. And, um, you know, so to not under know these things, but see, that's why we're bringing them up. Because you can mention to that too. Say, hey, look up the, uh, the prophecies that Joseph Smith made that have failed. Prophecy number three, the United States government to be overthrown in a few years. Here's the prophecy. I prophesy in the name of the Lord God of Israel, unless the United States redress the wrongs committed upon the saints in the state of Missouri and punish the crimes committed by her officers, that in a few years the government will be utterly overthrown and wasted and there will not be so much as a potsherd left for their wickedness in permitting the murder of men, women, and children and the wholesale plunder and extermination of thousands of our citizens to go unpunished. 
Notice he said that unless they redress the wrongs, he says in a few years, the government, the government will be utterly or completely overthrown and wasted. The government. He made this prophecy in May 6, on May 6th of 1843. The United States government didn't do anything to his threats. They didn't, they didn't redress any grievances that he had. And, you know, that was 1843. Here we are. Looks to me like the U.S. government is still standing. Now, what they'll do, and this isn't in here, but I read this also. Um, they'll try to say, oh, what he really meant was that there was a Democrat in charge then, and then the Republicans came and, and took over after the Democrat was out of office. Like, that's not what he said. <laughs> that's not what he said at all. He said the government, the government, not one party of the government. He said the government will be utterly overthrown and wasted. Anyways, um, there's another one who he prophesied Congress to be broken up as a government. Now look, when do you see that in scripture anyways from any of the other prophets? Oh, your government is going to go, you know, like, if you don't apologize to us, then the government's going to be broken down to nothing. Like, men of God don't, don't say that and fight against the government. Not saying that, that, you know, because that's not our battle. We're not here just to fight against governments. And then um, this one's kind of pertinent. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all these at all. There's, there's a few. There's, there's a few. I'll, uh, this one's kind of pertinent, though, to something I'm going to be looking at a little bit later. Finding treasure in Salem, Massachusetts. So this prophecy is recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 111. The introduction to this prophecy, found at the beginning of section 111, states, Revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet at Salem, Massachusetts, August 6, 1836. At this time, the leaders of the LDS Church were heavily in debt due to their labors in the ministry. So they're already in debt. They're just racking up credit. One, I, the Lord your God, am not displeased with your coming this journey, notwithstanding your follies. Two, I have much treasure in this city for you, for the benefit of Zion and many people in this city, whom I will gather out in due time for the benefit of Zion through your instrumentality. Three, therefore it is expedient that you should form acquaintance with men in this city as you shall be led and as it shall be given you. Four, and it shall come to pass in due time that I will give this city into your hands, that you shall have power over it, insomuch that they shall not discover your secret parts, and its wealth pertaining to gold and silver shall be yours. Five, concern not yourselves about your debts, for I will give you power to pay them. No treasure was ever discovered, nor did Salem ever fall into the hands of the Mormons. These are prophecies. But this is how they keep their people going and say, oh, you know, at, at some point, we have a lot of followers going, well, what are we going to do? We're in all this debt. We don't have any money. How are we going to pay this off? And Joseph Smith, oh, I got a word from God. God just said, keep on spending. He'll cover our debts. And there's all kinds of riches and gold and stuff here. And we just need to talk to people. And, and God will lead you in that. And they'll give you money. And we'll just, we'll, we'll end up, you know, being in charge of this place and getting all of their treasures. And if you got a leader that's convincing enough, you got a leader that talks real good, you get a bunch of people to follow you. And that's what Joseph Smith did. He had a lot of people in his cult. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have that many people to start with. Not nearly like it is today. It's amazing that it's grown the way that it has. Um, yeah, I don't want to spend the rest of the time going through his failed prophecies, but here he prophesied of pestilence, hail, famine, and earthquakes to destroy the wicked. That didn't happen. And he prophesied for a temple to be built in Zion, Missouri. And that didn't happen. If I remember correctly, they got kicked out. Because they got kicked out of Illinois, and they got kicked out of Missouri and ended up in Salt Lake City. Yeah, there, here's where it says here, the, the Mormons were forced to flee Missouri due to persecution. And a temple was never built on the temple lot in the lifetime of Joseph Smith or within the generation of his contemporaries. So apparently they must have gone back and, and made a temple at some point, but he's saying it wasn't, you know, he prophesied it to be in his time and it didn't come to pass. So there's a lot, you know, I, I didn't read them, and there's a lot more than this too. This was a sampling 
of all the false prophecies. But that's one of the ways to tell if someone's a false prophet, if what they're saying doesn't come to pass. And unfortunately, people aren't looking at this seriously enough that are sucked in by this, but something to keep in mind that the information is out there and that we could use that. I'm probably going to be planning on making a, a Mormon pamphlet that'll have, that'll highlight some of these things real briefly and source them because it is important. Um, Joseph Smith, and that's why I wanted to read the one about the, about the treasure that he was promising. Joseph Smith was a con man. He was already, a, he, had, he has a rap sheet. I was looking at it in there uh, of all these times that he was arrested for all these various things. And, you know, it's easy for people to say, oh, yeah, it just shows he was persecuted because he's a prophet of God. No. The people who were persecuted as being prophets of God were actually persecuted because they were preaching the word of God. He was like prosecuted for murder and for theft and for bad banking, and for, you know, just for all these various, you know, crimes, like actual crimes. I'll read for you one, the, this one about um, being, because this, this, it boggles my mind how people can say that this was some man of God when you look at what he was arrested for, and then you look at the method that he claims he used to deliver the Book of Mormon. The way that he claimed, here, here's how he claims the Book of Mormon was revealed to him. So he was told, you know, here's where these plates are and you need to go dig them up. And supposedly he dug up these plates and there were these golden plates and they weighed like somewhere around 50 pounds or something like that. And um, they were on really, really thin plates of gold that were like basically like paper thin. Okay. And all this, all the Book of Mormon was, was written in there. But it was written in uh, a cro like a mix between Hebrew and, and Egyptian language, and yeah, no one understood what it was. So he got this seeing stone, and when he put the seeing stone up to his eye, then he could see what it was really written, you know, in English. So he got two of the seeing stones, and he like made glasses out of it, and then he was able to read, and he called out to his buddy. He read what he was seeing. And then his buddy wrote it down. And that's the Book of Mormon. Okay? No one else was able to read this. But he was because he had the special seeing rocks. Reminds me of the blind leading the blind, right? You're putting rocks in front of your eyes. Because again, that's something that the Lord typically did when, you know, in delivering his word unto, unto his people. He made them put rocks in their eyes. But look at, listen to this, because this is what he got arrested for, okay? This is what he got arrested. It is funny. It's a joke. It really is a joke. But it's, it's true. That's what they believe. On March 20th, 1826, Smith was arrested by Constable Philip de Zeng and brought to court in Bainbridge, New York, on the complaint of Josiah Stowell's nephew, who accused Smith of being a disorderly person and an imposter. An anonymous writer claimed to have been given access to an account of court proceedings, which was published in Frazier's Magazine during 1873. In it, Smith described his divination methods, div divining, div divination methods, in order to find treasure. Okay, I'm going to read this. Smith said, He had a certain stone which he had occasionally looked at to determine where hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth were, that he professed to tell in this manner where gold mines were a distance underground and had looked for Mr. Stowell several times and had informed him where he could find these treasures. And Mr. Stowell had been engaged in digging for them, that at Palmyra he pretended to tell by looking at this stone where coined money was buried in Pennsylvania. And while a Palmyra had frequently ascertained in that way where lost property was of various kinds, that he had occasionally been in the habit of looking through this stone to find lost property for three years, but of late had pretty much given it up on account of its injuring his health, especially his eyes making them sore, that he did not solicit business of this kind and had always rather declined having anything to do with this business. Uh, and therefore, the court find the defendant guilty, um, blah, 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 the rest of this stuff. So what he was doing, he was using a stone to find treasure. 
That's what he was telling people. I've got this stone, and I could find lost items. I could find hidden gold. I could find gold mines buried deep under the ground. But the problem was, is that when I use this stone, it really hurts my eyes. You know, I have these, these bad effects from using this stone, and, it, and it's really injuring my health, and it makes my eyes sore, and I just don't like doing this anymore, so I just kind of stopped doing it. And he was getting people to, you know, to hire him or whatever to find this stuff. And he's just, I mean, he's totally full of it, obviously. But isn't it interesting how this method of using a stone to find stuff all of a sudden, oh yeah, and by the way, he used a stone to read these, these tablets that were given him to by the, the angel Moroni. It's a con man. It's a charlatan. Fake, phony, fraud. His prophecies didn't come to pass. Oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, man, I wish I had a little bit more time for this. That's all right. We're going to get through as much as I can. We, we did one of them when I told you about the dark skin people. But the Book of Mormon, I don't suggest reading it. But it's actually kind of comical. It's so obvious that it's a fraud. When anyone, you know, everyone in this room, I'm sure, has read your Bible enough to know how the Bible is written. And amazingly, how well the words of the Bible just, just go together, even from different writers. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and how it's all still written very, very similarly. You know, I mean, you're reading through and, and it's hard to even tell any, any nuances or distinctions between who's doing the writing because you're hearing God's word. You're reading God's word. When you read the Book of Mormon, it is an obvious fraud of trying to use words and phrases from other passages and then just kind of coming up with their own stuff. So a lot of it's like repeated scripture from other places because they're trying to make it sound like the Bible. The problem is they can't do it because it's totally fake. Totally fake. And, and what, you'll see what I'm saying when I read through this because you'll, you'll hear some phrase like, oh yeah, I know that scripture. I know that scripture. I know that scripture. So they take bits and pieces of scripture and just kind of throw it together and then add some words and change some words. So some of the Book of Mormon false teachings, there's some contradictions. I'm going to wait. I'm going to save this to the end if I have enough time for that because I have enough in my notes, I think, to kind of cover the rest of the time. And I want to get into this stuff. So the Mormon faith or the Mormon church, the Mormon cult. And I, you know, I don't even have everything on my, in my notes here because I wanted to, I really wanted to source everything that I'm saying. But look into like, I mean, they're, they're like a secret society. They build these temples. Not everyone's allowed in the temple. You have to be a certain type of Mormon to go in there. They have their certain undergarments that are holy undergarments that they're going to wear. And I didn't put any of that in here either because I really wanted to stay mostly on their scripture and on their word. But they have secret handshakes that they're supposed to learn in the temple. And there's a really interesting video that I saw a few years ago of someone that secretly recorded the, uh, like the inner workings of the temple. They're doing one of their um, rituals. And they have to learn these secret handshakes. And they like shake their, someone's hand, like they, they, they chant these things back and forth. And they're given a name. And they have, to, they have to know these handshakes because they're acting out what's going to happen, like to get into to heaven or whatever, right? To, and and I, I don't have all the knowledge on that, but I, you know, I, don't, I don't remember all the specific details on it, but they have to get their handshakes right and they go through this whole process. And it's like, you think God requires a secret handshake when you die? <laughs> like, how, do you, how do people buy into this? I don't know. But there's a recording out there. And, and you know, it's very like Masonic. Because the Masons do similar things. I mean, it's not exactly the same thing as Mormonism, but, you know, they have all their ties. They buddy buddy up. They get involved in politics. They get involved in, in all the construction industry and everything else and, and work with their friends and get kickbacks and everything else. The Mormon church works the same way. The people of the Mormon church do. I mean, you know which, I was talking to someone in Gilbert, because in Gilbert's heavily Mormon, they know like which ones aren't Mormon built, like structures and commercial buildings and things like that, and who, you know, it's hard to get a contract 
not being a Mormon because there's so many Mormons in, in uh, political office and stuff, so they give these government contracts out to their friends, to their Mormon friends, and they build the wealth of them that way. But um, anyhow, just as the Masons are very Luciferian, satanic, and you know, Luc Luciferian specifically because they look at Lucifer as the light angel, that's what Luz means, or Lucifer is a, you know, the son of the morning. But um, he is a, a light, you know, angel of light. And the Bible tells us that, that, he, that Satan is an angel of, was an angel of light. And um, they look to Satan as being a, um, you know, the giver of light and, and was actually a good being, not an evil. And that's what the, you know, the, the, Mason, the Masonic people, you know, the Illuminati will, will have that type of a, of a teaching. Mormonism isn't that far from that. They, don't, they won't claim that they hold Satan to be some good guy. They, they won't say that, and, that, and they don't teach that. But when you look at their actual teachings, it's basically saying the same thing. They just reword it, and they're not going to come out and be bold about saying that. But basically, they're teaching the same thing. This is from their uh, Second Nephi, again, chapter 2. Second Nephi, chapter 2. I'm gonna re and I tried to put these in context, too, because I, I got this straight from the, from the LDS website, their Book of Mormon uh, references. Verses 22 to 25. And now, behold, if Adam, this is going about talking about Adam and Eve, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen. But he would have remained in the Garden of Eden. And all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created. And they must have remained forever and had no end. What they're going to say is this is a bad thing. Now, what they said there is, you know, essentially true. You know, had Adam not sinned, they would have stayed in the Garden of Eden, right? I mean, they, they would have been there. The Garden would have been great. They would have been in the Garden of Eden. Everything's fine. But look at verse, there, verse 23, or 2 Nephi 2, says, and they would have had no children. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. It says that when, you know, when Eve was cursed, that her conception was going to, you know, the, the sorrow was going to be increased and multiplied, in her conception, it doesn't say that she wasn't going to have any children before that. But regardless, that's what they're saying. And they would have no children. They would have had no children. Wherefore, they would have remained in a state of innocence. Listen to this. Having no joy. They would have been in the Garden of Eden. Everything would have been great. They didn't sin. They would have been innocent. Having no joy, for they knew no misery. Doing no good, for they knew no sin. So in order to do good, apparently you have to know sin. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell that men might be, meaning like future men, because that's how they were able to have children. And men are that they might have joy. See, men exist that they might have joy. I'm sorry, I thought that we are and were created for his pleasure, not for our pleasure, not for our joy, for his pleasure. But no, and, and I found this, I didn't have enough time when I was doing all my preparations to, to put everything together. I found other references to talking about our happiness and our joy and just really focusing on the person. And what they're saying here basically is that ultimately what this is teaching is that it was a good thing that Adam sinned. Adam brought joy into this world. Adam made it so that other people can be born. Adam did a good thing by breaking the commandment of the Lord and eating of the forbidden fruit. How wicked of a doctrine is that? It's satanic. It's Luciferian. That's why you know, the, the Mormons teach that a good Mormon will become a god. Just like Satan said unto Adam and Eve. It's funny how everything goes back to Adam and Eve. The Bible says in Genesis 3, 5, for when Satan was speaking to Adam, or to Eve, excuse me, to Eve, when he was speaking to Eve, trying to convince Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit, he said, Satan said, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He enticed Eve with the thought of being God, being like God, God-like. And as a Mormon, you're a good Mormon. You're going to be like God. Here's another, here's an article that I, I'm going to read this for. These are clips because the article is huge. And I got this from LDS.org. I mean, this is from their own mouth. Now, the link, I had to get a cached link. 
because the main one wasn't working. So I don't know if they recently put it down, pulled it down or whatever because of the content of it, but this was from their website. And um, I'll just read it for you. And, and this is regarding their belief that they will be a God one day, that they will be gods. You talk about a satanic religion teaching you that you as a human being will be God. This is from the article. Latter-day Saints see all people as children of God in a full and complete sense. We see ourselves as children of God as being adopted children of God. They see themselves as being children of God in a full and complete sense, which we would believe as in like Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ was the son of God in a full and complete sense because he was God. And that's why people got angry with him because he, you know, you saying you're the son of God are making yourself equal with God. And that's what the Mormons believe that we all are. A full and complete sense. They consider every person divine in origin, nature, and potential. Each has an eternal core and is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents. We were born from spirit beings. Not that God created us. No, we were born of spirit beings. Each possesses seeds of divinity and must choose whether to live in harmony or tension with that divinity. Oh, oh isn't that nice? You could just live in tension. It's a little stressful. Uh, no, sin carries a penalty of hell. But anyways, through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all people may progress toward perfection and ultimately realize their divine destiny. Divinity, divine is like God-like, being God. Just as a child can develop the attributes of his or her parents over time, the divine nature that humans inherit can be developed to become like their heavenly fathers. This striking view of each human's... And, and I copied and pasted, I kind of mixed around a little bit because I was getting the pertinent stuff. It was, like I said, it was a really long article, but I'm just going to keep reading. This striking view of each human's potential future was accompanied by revealed teachings on humanity's past. As Joseph Smith continued to receive revelations, he learned that the light or intelligence at the core of each human soul was not created or made, neither indeed can be. The light or intelligence at the core of each human soul was not created or made. God didn't create it. Wasn't created. And it can't be. God is the father of each human spirit, and because only spirit and element, inseparably connected, receive a fullness of joy, he presented a plan for human beings to receive physical bodies and progress through their mortal experience toward a fullness of joy. Earthly birth, then, is not the beginning of an individual's life. And then their quotation is, man was also in the beginning with God. In the beginning was man. Likewise, Joseph Smith taught that the material world has eternal roots, fully repudiating the concept of creating ex nihilo. Uh, earth, water... All these had their existence in an elementary state from eternity, he said in an 1839 sermon. God organized the universe out of existing elements. That's saying that the universe already existed with God, that God did not create them. I'm mean, talking about blasphemy and just completely going against Scripture, yet people buy into this. People who don't know their Bible at all buy into this garbage. Joseph Smith continued to receive revelation from Satan. Oh, wait, that's, I'll read this. Joseph Smith continued to receive revelation on the themes of divine nature and exaltation during the last two years of his life in a revelation recorded in July 1843 that linked exaltation with eternal marriage. The Lord declared that those who keep covenants, including the covenant of eternal marriage, will inherit all heights and depths. Then, says the Revelation, shall they be gods because they have no end. They will receive a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. What a weird, just twisted doctrine. 
One last paragraph. Since that sermon known as the King Follett Discourse, the doctrine that humans can progress to exaltation and godliness has been taught within the church. Lorenzo Snow, the church's fifth president, coined a well-known couplet, as man now is, God once was. So the way that man is today, he's saying that's what God was. A long, long, long time ago, God was just a man. As God now is, Man may be. So you're saying how, how, man, how God is right now, we can achieve that. Man can become God. God used to be a man and became God. Man can become God. And you're going to tell me this is a prophet of the Lord? Thou shalt have no other gods beside me, before me. There, no, there are no other gods. I know not of any. Isaiah 43, Isaiah 45. There's been no God formed before me, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. Little has been revealed about the first half of this couplet, and consequently little is taught. When asked about this topic, church president Gordon B. Hinckley told a reporter in 1997, that gets into some pretty deep theology that we don't know very much about. When asked about the belief in humans' divine potential, President Hinckley responded, Well, as God is, man may become. We believe in eternal progression very strongly. So that's as recently as 1997, where you know, the, a, a church president, another prophet, was asked about it and maintained it. It's what the church teaches. Don't call me a liar. I got this from LDS.org. Like literally the website for the, for the Latter-day Satan church. All right, I'm way over time. Let me just finish this up. Oh, I meant, to, I meant to say this when I went over the things with the wives. I don't want to miss this. This is, I mean, this just goes to, to the extent of the cultic behavior from, from Joseph Smith. One, here, this is a quote from one of the 14-year-old girls that he married. This is a quote from Helen Marr Kimball is her name. My father asked me if I would be sealed to Joseph. Smith said to me, if you will take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. That's what Joseph Smith said to her. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. At 14 years old, she gave herself because Joseph Smith was saying, oh yeah, this will guarantee your eternal salvation, exaltation, and for your whole family. Oh wow, you mean by me marrying you at 14 years old, you're going to save my whole family? God's going to save you. Great. Sign me up. Wicked pervert. Amen. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't skip this either. 2 Nephi 25, verses 23 through 25. I'm not even going to tell you what's wrong with this. You just listen up when I read this. You're gonna, you've heard this before, and you might not have known it came directly from the Book of Mormon. I've heard this before at Soul Winning. There's not a whole lot of Mormons up here, not nearly as much as in Gilbert, so maybe you haven't heard this before. I've dealt with a lot of them, though, and I've heard this before out of their mouth. And I didn't even know that they're directly quoting from their Book of Mormon. For we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. And notwithstanding we believe in Christ, we keep the law of Moses and look forward with steadfastness unto Christ until the law shall be fulfilled. For, for this end was the law given, wherefore the law hath become dead unto us and we are made alive in Christ because of our faith. Yet we keep the law because of the commandments. Now, <laughs> the verse I really cared about was that first one I read, verse 23, because he says, by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. So, yeah, you, first you have to give it all you have. You have to do all of your work, do all of your work, do all your work. And then after all of that, then you're saved by grace. That's what they teach. That's why they get their, their works and faith mixed together. It's works and faith. And they don't even deny that. But it's verses like this, not coming from the Bible. And that's why they throw things in there like, oh, I and my Father are one, in purpose. Oh, you know, salvation by grace through faith, 
after everything you can do. I've had someone tell me that. I mean, and they're literally just quoting from this because they care and read way more from their little book of Mormon than they do about the whole Bible. That's what they study and that's what they teach from because it's of the devil and it's the devil's religion and that's what he wants to promote. He wants to promote the actual truth. Last point. Well, and then <laughs> that verse 25, I just thought this was stupid. I mean, you're talking about not coming from God, yet we keep the law because of the commandments. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> what does that even mean? We keep the law because of, we keep the law because of the law. That makes no sense. The commandments are the law. We keep the law because of the law. Okay. <laughs> stupid. You want to tell me that comes from God? Yeah. That's the majesty of God's word right there. It sounds like the writings and ramblings of some uneducated idiot because that's who Joseph Smith really was. He was uneducated. He was an idiot. And what he did was he was a con man and he tried to, to use words and phrases found in the Bible to make it sound like, oh, this is God-like. Oh, this is biblical-like. I'm speaking with church speak. Last point, Jesus and Satan, they believe, are spirit brothers. Spirit brothers, okay? Now they say, oh, no, no, we, I mean, Jesus is the son of God, and Satan is, a, you know, he's a fallen angel, and so, but, but hold on a second, I'm going to read this again. This is like from their own apologetics, from their own sources. I'm giving you this like pretty much from the horse's mouth, and uh, that's why I, you know, it took me a while to really compile a lot of this stuff because I, I want to make sure that I source this stuff. I don't want to say anything that's, that's incorrect, that's factually inaccurate, Mormons aren't going to like the way that I presented the information, and that's fine. But I hope they at least look it up, if any of them ever find you know, the video when we put up online and look at this stuff, because it's ridiculous. And if you're going to be honest with yourself, and if you honestly care about the truth, and if you honestly care about what's right and knowing who God is, and if you actually believe that the Bible is God's word, like all of Christianity supposedly believes and you want to call yourself Christian, then why don't you compare what your so-called prophet wrote with Bible scripture that's accepted by everybody? Here's what they said about, you know, because someone asked this question, and again, it's, an, it's, a, it's a Mormon apologetics. It's not LDS.org, but it's something very similar. It's someone who is a Mormon, like, trying to defend the Mormon faith. He put, it is technically true to say that Jesus and Satan are brothers in the sense that both have the same spiritual parent, God the Father. Because again, remember, they believe in spirit babies, that God the Father had a relationship, apparently, with a, with a, with a woman, a spiritual woman, and produced all these spirit babies, of which we, you know, we are, according to them, and Jesus and Satan. They have no problem. Oh yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, but so are you. They, they, they equal themselves with Jesus. And in a sense here, they're equating, you know, I mean, Jesus and Satan are brothers. So I'm going to keep reading. It says, God the Father also had many other spirit children created in his image and that of his only begotten. I think, it meant, I think he meant to say then that of his only begotten. These children include all humans born on the earth. That's what I just said. I mean, this is coming from their mouth. These children... These other spirit children include all humans born on the earth. Some of God's children rebelled against him and contested the choice of Jesus as Savior. So there was this, this thing going on. There was a choice between who was going to be the Savior of the world. And it came to a, a, a thing between Satan and Jesus. And they presented their plans, and Jesus was chosen to be the Savior of the world and not Satan. And Satan got upset by that and rebelled. So... Anyone who contested or argued the choice of Jesus being Savior to any of these spirit people before they were given human bodies were all became followers of Satan. Um, the leader of these children was Lucifer or Satan. Those spirit children of God who followed Satan in his rebellion against Christ are sometimes referred to as demons or devils. Thus, it is technically true to say that Jesus and Satan are brothers in the sense that both have the same spiritual parent, God the Father. This guy is, is saying that, yeah, that's true, basically. 
He, wanted, he took a long time defending why, oh, it's not true, and then said, well, yeah, technically it is true. That is what you believe. Yeah, you do believe that Jesus Christ and Satan or Lucifer are brothers. How wicked is that? God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, is Satan's brother? Are you kidding me? Jesus Christ, the Creator, is brothers with Satan? Hebrews 7, 3, without father, without mother. Jesus Christ doesn't have a father. I mean, he was the son, of man, the son of God and the son of man here on this earth. And he's known as the son to the father and was begotten physically on this earth through the father. But I'll tell you what, Jesus Christ was not, is not a created being. He's always existed. That's why Hebrews 7, 3 says, without father, without mother, Without descent. He didn't descend like we do. Have a descendancy. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. I'm talking about Melchizedek, which is Jesus Christ. So I have so much more, but we're not going to do it tonight. It's already been a really long sermon. So um, hopefully you picked up something new something that you can just throw out there. You know, again, I recommend giving the gospel to people first, using the power of God's word to see if they'll listen to that. Sometimes they'll let you, you know, Mormons more so than many other people will actually have a conversation with you. So you try to give them the gospel. If they're not going to receive God's word, then I do recommend bringing up some other information about their cult, exposing their cult as being a fraud and being false and maybe give them something else to get on the path of just of questioning whether or not what they believe is really true because you've given them facts stating that this is, you know, this is a fraud. You've been duped. You've been fooled. And when you, when you realize that you've been fooled, come back and talk to me and I'll show you what the Bible really says about being saved. Let's bow our heads and have a word of, a word of a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for providing this, this great uh, book of knowledge and wisdom to us, your holy words. And um, God, we thank you for saving our souls through great, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, Lord. I pray that you please help us to reach people who are caught up in, in the cult of the Mormon religion, dear Lord, and help us to reach them with your words, the truth, and um, help us to... to have the most information we can at our fingertips to be able to um, to just just lead these people to you. God, that's the ultimate goal. That's what we want. That's what we're here for. Help us to, to reach those that, um, that have been deceived. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.